it comes to me. So yes, it comes to you. Uh, that's fine. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, where UNCDF and the Cities Alliance have joined together to make a presentation of their joint publication, looking at infrastructure investment and local economic development in secondary cities in Ghana and Uganda. Um, my name is Billy Cobbett. I'm the director of the Cities Alliance in Brussels, and I'm very glad to represent the organization and also to, uh, to thank my colleague who can't join me just yet, David Jackson from UNCDF, the director with whom we've had- Good morning, a, a... Billy. I made it uh, through the technocratic difficulties uh, and I'm online, technical difficulties, I should say. Thank you, David. So I'll pass over to you in a minute. We are, we are live at the moment. So if I just make a few opening comments on behalf of the Cities Alliance. Of course, first, I'd like to, to thank uh, FCDO and obviously D DFID as its, as its predecessor for the financial support, which underscored uh, much of this work. Um, now that David's here, I'd like to formally acknowledge the excellence of our working relationship and thank him and his team, uh, which is in evidence today for the, for the intellectual leadership and support that they have provided. And particularly, I would like to thank uh, the local governments of Cape Coast, Agora Swedu uh, in Ghana, Anambali and Gulu in Uganda, because without them, this doesn't make any sense. So a, f a few short comments uh, before I hand over to David from my perspective. I don't want to anticipate what the presenters are going to say. But here we have a combination of the general and the specific. The general conditions within which these secondary cities in Ghana and Uganda are very evident in multiple countries in Africa. And I just pick out a few of the themes that emerge from, from the publication without preemptive without preempting anything, I believe. <laughs> Weak revenue collection, um, erratic intergovernmental fiscal transfers, continued unplanned and informal growth, uh, huge infrastructural backlogs, limited local government capacity, and an unbalanced, if I can put it like that, relationship between national and local governments. These are, are, are fairly evident across multiple countries in Africa and not only in Africa. I mean, there have been features of development in, in Latin America and in Asia. That's, that's the general and it provides a background against which any local government or most local governments and particularly secondary cities in Africa have to contend. What I find fascinating about this publication is it, it against the background of the general it looks at the specific through a comparative analysis of two countries through the eyes of four secondary cities, the ones I've already mentioned. And there the specifics start to become very interesting indeed. And I'm just going to mention them without, without editorializing on them. Uh, I, what I found striking was one, the difference in the natural population growth between the two countries over the last five decades. And we can speculate what the impact of that, but the the, diff, the, the variation is striking, uh, and and we know that Uganda has one of the first, fastest growing populations anywhere in the world. The second is the how the GDP uh, per capita differential plays out, with a factor nearly of three times greater in Ghana than it is in Uganda. And the question is, what explains that that differential? It also underscores, just by the by, uh, it, it really underscores the differences that exist amongst 454 different countries in Africa. I mean, we are explaining very clearly how uh, Uganda and, and Ghana have different paths. Equally important that I would highlight is a higher urbanization rate in Ghana, um, well over double the rate of Uganda. And it is interesting. So the, the population growth uh, in, Uganda, in Uganda has largely not driven urban growth itself, um, or at least that it, at, at surface, surface level would seem to be one of the conclusions. And the last one, which is so critical for our topic of infrastructure investment and economic growth uh, is 
sustainable energy in general and the provision of electricity in particular. And there we see 22% coverage in Uganda against nearly 80% in Ghana. And, and these are general uh, conditions and also some very specific uh, variables between these two countries. And that is why I thought this, this, this publication was so important um, and so relevant and why I look, why we were glad to participate and I look forward to, to the discussion. So over to you, David, on my behalf, on behalf of the Cities Alliance, welcome to everybody. And my thanks, and I'm sure I'll say this again at the end, to our colleagues um, in Ghana, Uganda, and in UNCDF elsewhere. David. Thank you so much indeed, uh, Billy, and uh, thank you very much indeed to all of Cities Alliance for this uh, excellent collaboration, and of course the colleagues from the, the cities themselves. Um, I'll leave it to the panel to talk about the details of the report, and uh, I, I just wanted to highlight, I think, some of the bigger picture uh, that this report will feed into. Uh, and why it is so important and so critical uh, now and that the lessons are taken forwards. And, and I'll just start with one particular statistic that has been mentioned before, but I think it's useful to think about. If you look at a city like Paris in France, it took that city 100 years to go from being half a million uh, people to one million people. Now, if you, took, if you look at Lagos in uh, Nigeria, it took Lagos 15 years to go from half a million to a million inhabitants. And other cities are now making that transition even quicker. So the pace of urbanization in some parts of the world, particularly parts of Africa and parts of Asia, is pretty much unprecedented. Uh, and then if you look at the other patterns that have uh, gone alongside other urbanizations, rapid urbanizations, for example, there has been rapid urbanization in parts of China, parts of the um, other parts of Asia, such as Taiwan, Japan, in, 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 in the last, let's say, 70 or 80 years. That urbanization is accompanied by a very high rate of investment. So you have, for example, uh, South Korea, in the 70s and 80s was also urbanizing at an extraordinary rate, uh, but it, that was accompanied by 45% of the GDP was investment expenditure. And that's why those cities look like they do, high rise uh, cities. Now, what, what we see in parts of Asia and parts of Africa is the same rate of urbanization, but not the same level of investment. And that then means that this urbanization is low productivity. Uh, and it means that it's not being accompanied by the same rise in family income uh, as uh, is happening in, um, in, in other parts of the world that have gone through such a, a rapid rate of urbanization. It also means that um, you know, the, 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 there's a huge opportunity to get it right this time, because nobody is suggesting that some of the, the rapid urbanization that we've seen in other parts of the world is perfect. Because uh, one key element, and I'm sure our colleagues in Cities Alliance will be aware of this, is the way in which uh, rapidly growing cities can accommodate and build on the strengths of the, uh, the, the existing neighborhoods the existing patterns of settlements, uh, rather than literally uproot um, the whole city and move it to high rise concrete blocks. That's not necessarily the way to go either. But what is important is investment, forward thinking, forward planning, and getting the, the structure in place for that investment to be able to build on the strengths of the existing cities uh, as they grow. Uh, key, uh, and so I think what this um, report does is then gets into the granular detail of this with regards to these two cities we're talking about. I mean, that's the bigger picture. Now, when you zoom in and you look at what's that going to mean um, in the practical uh, uh, application, that's where this report will really help. So I hope that this discussion will help us understand how cities are all different from each other, 
Uh, as Billy has outlined, there are great contrasts and it's important to understand those contrasts. That's the importance of doing things locally because local is different, but also that there is a bigger picture um, that we need to address. And that is the, the, the critical urgency of unlocking investment for Africa's cities right now and learning the lessons of the mistakes of previous urbanizations, as well as the need for the volume in previous urbanizations. And then if that's not urgent enough, I'll throw in a further uh, element into the mix and that is climate change. Of course, in the seventies and eighties, we were not thinking enough about that. And when you put climate change in the mix and you see how critical it is to make the uh, urbanization and growing city investment resilient and adaptive um, and able to produce the jobs required for the uh, 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 growing uh, populations in a resilient and adaptive way. It's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but if we get it right, then these cities will show the way forwards uh, for the future. And um, so it, 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 this report I think is critical in the sense that it provides the granular detail to one of the big challenges facing the world today. So I'm going to hand over to, um, uh, I think it's Jaffa Mashano who will uh, moderate the, uh, the discussion. Um, thank you so much indeed everybody for, for joining us. Uh, this will be a fascinating meeting. I may dive off a little bit, but I'll be back uh, at, at the end. And um, I'm online, even if not um, active. There's, a, there's another call I have to take in a moment. But thank you so much, Cities Alliance, and thank you so much, everybody, for contributing to this uh, very valuable report. Uh, Jaffa, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you, um, Billy. Um, Mr. Thompson, I think we can start with the presentation. And I would like to introduce Mr. Thompson, who's gonna share uh, his screen uh, for the presentation. Uh, he's our technical advisor who has put with the support of our teams on the ground in Uganda and Ghana has supported um, the knowledge product uh, from where we are. Uh, Mr. Thompson. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear was it yes, we can hear you. And you can see the presentation, that's good. Yes, can you right. uh, uh, expand into a presentation mode? Uh, let's see here. Yep. Can you can you see it? Yeah, that's better. Please go Terrific. ahead. Terrific. All right. So within the next 20 minutes, I'll have to present highlights of the, the report. I'm especially glad that the two uh, speakers uh, set the parameters that uh, the two contexts, the general context, which more or less reflect the, the, the history or the colonial legacy of the two countries, both former uh, colonial uh, possessions, and then the specifics, which to a large extent reflect uh, policy and governance in each of the, the countries uh, involved. I'm trying to move. Okay, all right. Am I on track? Can you see what I'm doing? Yes. Okay, good. So I'll go on with the assumption that. Yep, so we started ahead. with the broad economic profiles. The study, of course, started with the two cities in Ghana and then the two cities in uh, Uganda. But in order for us to be able to compare the two, it's important that we set the larger context. So we decided to look at the uh, its general structure of their national economies. And on the uh, graph there on the projector, you see what happened between 1960 and 2018. Ghana's economy has generally been bigger than that of uh, Uganda, both in absolute terms and in per capita terms also. But the gap is quite substantial. And in fact, it's wider in 2018. If you divide the 643 by 2002 uh, by, uh, compared to what it was in 1960. And then I decided to look at structural change and transformation. I put change and trans 
uh, there in red to suggest that you can have structural change without necessarily having structural transformation where you actually move resources from inefficient sectors to more efficient ones. And here I would just quickly like to highlight a few of the, the differences. If you look at agriculture, in the case of Ghana, that's the top panel, you notice to the right-hand side that between 2000 and 2018, its share of GDP actually fell by 17 percentage points. And its share of employment also fell by 21.1 percentage points. That's a sign of structural change. That means the resources are now moving to more efficient areas, industry and services. Ideally, industry should grow a lot faster than it did in Ghana to absorb more of that. But most of the labor that left agriculture then went into services. If we move to the bottom and we look at Uganda, you see some movement towards structural change also where GDP share, uh, agriculture share of GDP fell by 3%. But that of employment in agriculture actually went up slightly by almost 1%. That's a sign of reversal in structural transformation, which is reflected in the other figures also. Um, I'm having problems changing this thing here. Uh, okay, I hope I, I have it. Now we then move to uh, electricity, that which has been talked about, so I won't spend too much time. The gap is really wide and it's quite, it's, it's still growing. In the case of Uganda, the uh, coverage for electricity is just 22%, which is still just over half of the average for our low income countries, which Uganda is classified as uh, being one. And if you look at Ghana, it's almost 80%, which is quite high compared to Uganda, but it's still slightly lower than the average for lower middle income countries, which Ghana is one. And then we look at population levels also. Uh, 1960, Ghana and Uganda were roughly the same size, 6.7 roughly, but then by 2018, Uganda was almost 13 million more than Ghana. That's not to say that Ugandan men have been uh, busier than Ghanaian men, so to speak. But as I say in the report, it's partly because Uganda is also home to the largest refugee population in Ghana. And most of that huge growth in population levels is due to the influx of uh, refugees, most of whom are now permanent residents in Uganda. So it has its own implications for development in terms of resource, demand on resources, and of course, contribution to economic growth as well. And then we have urban populations. Uganda's, of course, remain relatively low. Ghana is around 56% in 2018, compared to 23% for Uganda the same year. And the interesting thing is that Uganda's population uh, urbanization rate in 2018 is roughly the same as it was for Ghana in 1960. That means Despite the appearance of rapid population growth, it is still uh, relatively uh, more rural than it is uh, urban. And this is the case for Africa generally. Despite the rapid urbanization in Africa as a whole, it is still the least urbanized continent according to the UN's uh, uh, urbanization, uh, World Urbanization Prospects Report. So there are issues there in terms of growth and population and how to manage that population in terms of human settlements and use. I'll just quickly look at some highlights of this where we compare the two cities in Ghana with the two cities in Uganda. Again, the, the features are more or less the same, reflecting the same uh, governance of post-colonial structures with the exception of two main ones on governance uh, in Ghana, we still appoint our mayors or DCs, whereas in Uganda, they elect them. And it's interesting because Uganda actually came to Ghana for some sort of tutorials on local governance, but then they've gone ahead and actually elect their local officials, whereas Ghana more or less still appoints the DCs with a limited number of elections. The main responsibilities are the same, providing basic services for communities. Economic highlights are more or less the same commercial dominated by the informal sector, more so in Uganda than it is in Ghana. Revenue sources are more or less the same local plus revenues from uh, donors and the central government. And then of course, we have uh, the providers 
of infrastructure who tend to be, uh, uh, let me see what's going on here. Okay. So quickly, let me just highlight some of these national enablers. These ones are embedded in, in institutions. So the structure of local government also has an impact on local economic development. Functions of local government are specified by law also have implications for local economic development as well as the source. So these are institutionally embedded factors. And then we look at financing. As it's explained in the report, again, Uganda is more flexible in terms of financing arrangements in, in Ghana. In Ghana, there's actually a cap on how much the local government can borrow. In Uganda, it is tied to revenue, up to 25% of local revenue. But because revenues are low, they don't really borrow that much. And when they do borrow, again, because revenues are low, they find it difficult sometimes servicing their debt. So that has led them with very low revenue anyway for a general administration of local government and also for the provision of infrastructure. And that's partly because both governments also shifted from capital budgeting to MTEF in the early 1990s. And I think in the report, I cite an IMF report of MTEF that says that because it was mostly driven by donors, it didn't really gain the traction and it ended up doing more harm to some of these countries than it actually did in terms of the good that we thought it would be. So now we move to the various options for financing infrastructure, infrastructure being critical to local economic growth. I look at pay as you go, as they call it uh, generally, that is you finance infrastructure as the money comes in. If the money doesn't come in, you stop. And then you have bond or intergenerational financing where you borrow either through bonds or loans to spread the benefits and the cost of infrastructure across generations. And then you have mixed financing, which is the mix of the two, depending on the structure of infrastructure. If it's big ticket items, it's always preferable to use intergenerational finance. And if it's minor infrastructure uh, updates and so, so forth, then you can use pay as you go. We have public-private partnership, which is also good, but it's, it, to a large extent, it also depends on how it is structured so that it's mutually beneficial. And more importantly, the capacity of the government, the local government or the national government to monitor the performance of the private companies involved. It's not always the case that because it's public-private partnership, it is mutually beneficial. Sometimes because of lack of capacity, governments actually end up getting the short end of the stick. And then we also have civic, private, or corporate finance infrastructure, sometimes as part of their civic responsibilities. But you need to, as local government, have a framework for tracking all these infrastructure because they each have implications in the future for budgeting. So if let's say a company builds a hospital for a local area, that has implications for the hiring of doctors, nurses, pharmacists, drivers, and other things in the future. And you must be able to plan for that. Don't just accept it and hope that you'll be able to do that. And you will be able to manage it in, in the future only if you do proper capital budgeting, which the two countries really aren't very good at. And then we have infrastructure by state-owned enterprises. This has been the main approach to infrastructure provision uh, in most post-colonial economies, because at the uh, uh, beginning of independence, they really didn't have the structure. So the state stepped in. So they provide uh, water, they provide electricity, they provide sometimes uh, uh, roads and so forth and so on. It's up to each government then to have a structure that balances the two so that it gives local governments some control over the provision of these and so that they can then guide local economic development. And the report makes recommendations as to how to uh, exactly structure that. So out of that, then we settle on bond markets and PPPs as some of the main approaches to finance and infrastructure. It doesn't dismiss the other options. They are still very much uh, relevant and applicable. You can mix them if you have proper capital budgeting, but we settle on the two, which is long-term or intergenerational financing and PPPs for two. Now before then, as I stated earlier, Uganda, for instance, has the advantage of borrowing up to 25% of revenue, but because economic activity is low, revenue is low, and therefore, if we are to resort to using bonds to finance infrastructure, then we must equally focus 
on the quality of local economic development. And here, I proposed a new, more compact framework for promoting local economic development. If you review the literature, you realize that there's a very limited understanding and application of local economic development, but this one makes it very simple. There's a slight difference between what you see on the screen now and what appears in the report. I've changed the top one, uh, the box at the top here, uh, it's business development. It appears in the original as economic development. I changed it because I figured you cannot use the same words to define itself. So instead of using economic development, it's not business development. It also helps to formulate private sector development policies to guide the promotion of businesses by local governments and working closely with local uh, businesses for local economic development. And then the second one here appears in the original report as just infrastructure. Now, based on the spirit and discussions of the report, I've expounded that to make that infrastructure and spatial development. But they're essentially the same. They've all been discussed in the report as they appear here. It's just that in the framework, I've highlighted them. The bottom one, social development, remains the same. And ultimately, as you see in the report, they are all uh, interdependent. They reinforce each other. When I met some businessmen in Aguna Suedru, for example, one of them told me that he was having difficulties getting the right skill of labor to work for him. And so you see the importance of social development to business development and ultimately economic development. So this is the, the new framework or what I call the new lead to promote local economic, economic development as the central strategy for doing these things. And then we move to um, the new proposal for this. I think I've touched on this a little bit, but I need to emphasize that the blue panel you see at the top, here in the middle is capital budgeting. We need to do capital budgeting linked to spatial planning. Too often, both in Ghana and in Uganda, uh, capital uh, budgeting or uh, infrastructure development is removed from spatial, uh, spatial planning. That has major implications in terms of cost. There are some slums in Ghana, Accra specifically, not necessarily the areas where I studied, but where the local governments have actually designated that they should have pipelines, people have already built in those areas. So that means for all practical purposes, it will be impossible in the future to provide pipe warm water into homes in that area, all because we didn't link infrastructure planning to social uh, uh, planning. So these need to be looked together as two sides of the same coin. Uh, as the two countries or the, the two sets of municipal municipalities uh, enhance their capital budget. And another thing you notice in the mid middle part here that capital assets are split into infrastructure and non-infrastructure. This is very critical because in some instances it, you can look at capital budgets in general and notice that they are growing but they are growing towards what? Are they growing towards infrastructure such as roads, markets, lower parks, or are they growing towards vehicles, for example, for government officials? And this has been shown to be the case in Ghana. And I'm pretty sure it happens in Uganda. As a matter of fact, at the height of the COVID last year, in Sierra Leone, for example, the government bought 30 new land cruisers ostensibly to monitor the pandemic. So that, for instance, will qualify as improvements in capital spending, but it's not towards the kind of infrastructure that we need. So once you've made these critical distinctions, you then, as I said earlier, have to be able to project the implications for future operational or recurrent budgets. Otherwise, you end up a situation, in a situation where you have a lot of infrastructure development going on, but in terms of managing them, schools, hospitals, and other places that require staff you will always fall short. And so monies for improving infrastructure or maintaining infrastructure in the future may then go into just paying salaries. And that itself creates its own deficits in terms of the quality of infrastructure development. And then there, there are the three uh, graphs that you see over there, which I thought is actually quite interesting. Here, I looked at the macroeconomic uh, aspects of national enablers of local development. In the report itself, I talked about how high inflation, which is beyond the control of local governments, actually undermined the purchasing power 
of uh, local revenue, unstable uh, foreign exchange also undermines business planning and so forth. And so macroeconomic stability is very critical for the promotion of local economic development and finance and infrastructure. It just so happens that when you compare Ghana to Uganda, Uganda has a much better record of macroeconomic stability than Ghana does. So at the top right-hand corner, we look at the depreciation of the Ugandan shilling and the Ghanaian city. And the Ghanaian city has depreciated consistently much faster than the Ugandan uh, shilling. The Ugandan shilling has depreciated on average by 6 0.5%, and for Ghana, it's almost 13%, more than double the rate of depreciation for uh, 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 Uganda. You look at inflation, it's the same. Uganda has performed much better than Ghana. And when you look at average lending rates, they are much higher in Ghana than they are in Uganda. So here, a very interesting paradox emerges where Ghana has high, um, or highly unstable macroeconomic environment but it has a much more aggressive policy towards sectoral investments. So despite high inflation, high depreciation and all that, Ghana seems to be making more aggressive investments to grow the economy. Whereas Uganda has stable macroeconomic environment, but it is not making the kind of aggressive in, uh, uh, sectoral investments in agricultural industry services that would then grow the economy. So you have latent potential not being fully utilized by Uganda, and in the case of Ghana, a situation where they kind of lost control over uh, macroeconomic uh, management. So this is one key lesson for Ugandan policymakers that they are sitting on the potential for driving or accelerating economic growth, of course, at the local level and ultimately at the national level. And so here at the on the last slide, I then have a summary of the recommendations that we make in the report. One, each of them should accelerate structural transformation. Of course, Uganda has a lot more uh, ground to cover than Ghana, but still, Ghana also has some ways to go. Industry is still not growing as much as it should, and so we should work on that. We should strengthen population management, not just in terms of slowing growth, but also in terms of population distribution, such that there's no uh, excess uh, pressure on particular settlements or cities or towns intensified national electrification programs. Yes, Ghana has much wider uh, uh, access for electricity, but sometimes quality is a problem. So Ghana needs to improve quality. Uganda needs to improve both quantity and quality. The uh, establishment of uh, bond markets for both countries. It's a national policy uh, that will benefit local government. Robust macroeconomic policies. I think Uganda has an advantage there, but it needs to take full advantage of macroeconomic stability. And then local level uh, recommendations, threats to decentralization, strengthen analysis of population impact on local development planning, address informality. And I'll talk about that when we move to the next section. Technological institutional challenges uh, remain unaddressed. Coordinated basic infrastructure services from state-owned enterprises. I think I talked about that. So there's synergy between local governments and these state-owned enterprises. Strengthen public-private sector partnerships for mutual benefits, adopt a new approach to local economic development, which is the new lead that I discussed, adopt new approaches to budgeting, I've also touched on that. And then finally, link infrastructure development to spatial planning as a way of taking full advantage of urbanization. And with that, I think I've exactly exhausted my 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Mr. Thompson. Um, that was a very good presentation and uh, we really appreciate it. So in the next segment, um, we will have panel number one, um, which we want to hear the voices of those who actually manage uh, um, these local governments um, and especially the technical people who on a day-to-day -day basis um, uh, face these challenges going forward. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, uh, the panel. Uh, from Agona Swedru, we have uh, Mr. Ishmael uh, Ogiefo. From Cape Coast, we have Mr. Richmond Yeboa. Uh, from Gulu, Uganda, we have Mr. Edward Kiwanuka. And from Bale, Uganda, we have Mr. Bala Richard Michael. Um, for all of those who are participating, please, if you have any questions because of time 
and uh, we don't have specific question and answer session, please put it in the chat. There are people managing the question and answer chat um, and we will answer them as the program is going along. Um, so thank you, my panelists. I will start with a few questions. Please introduce yourself quickly and then, uh, uh, and then we will go into uh, um, understanding of what the presentation from Mr. Thompson has sort of uh, defined uh, this challenge. So maybe we start with uh, Richmond. Um, Richmond, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever um, you are. Um, it's a privilege to represent the Cape Coast Metropolitan Assembly in this engagement. Um, uh, it was a good presentation uh, by Dr. Nimoy Thompson. I think um, over the last couple of uh, weeks, um, no, months, um, we've been working uh, with him um, on, on this project. He's been coming to Cape Coast uh, for data holding uh, conferences and seminars um, on this. So um, I appreciate um, what um, Doc um, presented. I am Richmond Yaboa, uh, representing the city of Cape Coast, uh, and I'm ready to assist in the conversation. Thank you. So Richmond, maybe you can give us a little bit of a snapshot of the, let's start with the finances of um, Cape Coast. How do they look like? How do you finance infrastructure? Um, where do you get your source of funding? And um, what's your view about it? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, like uh, Doc um, presented, um, when you come to um, Cape Coast and Ghana, um, uh, financing infrastructure uh, comes from uh, three uh, main sources. Uh, central government transfer. Uh, apart from that, we have the internally generated funds uh, from the local assembly. And then also we have um, the third one, uh, um, uh, transfers from donors, uh, World Bank and other uh, uh, de de um, um, development institutions also uh, support our development. And so these are the main uh, 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 financing um, sources for infrastructure in the city of Cape Coast. Um, if I am to um, continue, like um, um, Doc mentioned, um, when it comes to uh, financing infrastructure um, in the city of Cape Coast, which is growing, um, the, the gap is, is, is the, the gap keeps on widening because of um, uh, the fact that the central government transfers uh, do not come on time. And when they come, there are so many deductions. And so whatever is received at the base, we are unable to undertake any meaningful uh, uh, development. And apart from that, um, the IGF2 um, sometimes, depending on the atmosphere, uh, for example, when we are close to elections, enforcement of the laws to get um, the, the people to pay taxes and all of that are, are, are minimal because if you enforce the laws um, um, uh, on the people, uh, if you don't take care, um, they will vote against the government and so when it gets to election years um, we are unable to uh, have an aggressive um, system uh, to collect um, taxes uh, from the people so IGF um, uh, reduces and so it affects infrastructure uh, development and then donor funding um, and uh, donor funding of, of, of late is, is not forthcoming even though we receive one or two uh, but um, what we receive is not something that uh, is able to support um, our development, especially with the infrastructure needs um, of, of the city. And so I think um, the city of Cape Coast, with the engagements that we had with the doc when he visited for uh, this project, I think we agree with him that there is a need to find other means of raising uh, uh, funding uh, for uh, uh, capital expenditure going forward. So we subscribe to um, the public-private uh, partnership already, we've had uh, some, uh, some engagements on that, and um, we, we think that 
is something that we can uh, make good use of it. Uh, but now it comes back to legal and institutional framework. Uh, before the municipality is able to have um, uh, uh, the private uh, partner to come on board to provide uh, uh, public services, there is a need to have um, that proposal approved by the Ministry of Finance. And it's also uh, uh, has some uh, 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 challenges when it comes to having a successful PPP arrangement for um, infrastructure um, uh, development. Richmond, so, I give you one more minute. Sorry. Okay, no problem. So I yeah. Uh, so uh, that is something that uh, we think uh, PPP is good. Uh, but going forward, if um, we think that that is the surest way uh, to uh, fund infrastructure, then of course we, we have to look at the. Uh, 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 legal and then institutional framework. And, and, and then finally, the bond market is something that um, we think is good that um, the local authorities can also explore uh, to make sure that we can fund infrastructure. Because you come, uh, some school projects began four years ago uh, because government transfers are, are not forthcoming, um, we are unable to complete them. And like Doc said, it, 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 it increases the cost of such projects and at the end of the day they are huge um, problems uh, for the city thank you very much thank you just a quick question what is the percentage of national government transfers to to your finances from your finances perspective what's the percentage i i it is very difficult to determine that because um depending on average on on on, on average on average, I would say that um, it's, it's, it's about 60% of, of the revenue that you receive um, in the uh, municipality. Thank you. Thank you a lot about that. I would like to shift to um, Ishmael. Ishmael, how, how are you? You are on mute, Ishmael. Yeah, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, please. So um, based on the discussion, the way it's going, can you give us a little bit of uh, uh, introduction for your uh, city, um, uh, uh, Agona Swedru, and uh, how does the finances and, and fi especially financing of inf infrastructure looks like? Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm Ishmael from uh, Agnes Redro. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, all of you, wherever you find yourself. Uh, Agnes West Municipal Assembly is uh, one of the municipalities in Ghana and for that matter, uh, Central Region. Uh, it has a, a population of uh, 144. Uh, thousand with a female population constituted about 53.1 percent, a male population about 46.9 uh, uh, percent. It's uh, mainly agrarian economy. You know, many of the people are into agriculture. Uh, also, quite sizable, which is about 49.4 uh, percent, with about 39.4 percent also into commercial activities. Uh, Dr. Nemo Thompson has been interacting with this uh, for quite some time, uh, almost about uh, two years, and we've engaged him in a, a, a couple of uh, issues. So uh, the presentation that he's, he made is exactly uh, what is pertaining in the uh, Aguna West Municipal Assembly. Like uh, my colleague from Cape Coast has uh, mentioned, that's Richmond, uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, it's the same situation we find yourself ourselves in uh, Aguna West Municipal Assembly. We also we have basically because I mean we are in the same country, so basically three ways we finance our infrastructure. We have um, the internal generator funds, we have the decentralized transfer, and also the uh, donor uh, funds uh, for infrastructure. Uh, greater share of uh, finance come from the decentralized transfer and the uh, donors uh, support. Basically about uh, uh, 65 to 70% of our uh, financing for infrastructure comes from decentralized transfer and uh, 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 donors. Um, let's see, 
let me give you some kind of um, information for the, the salary transfer mainly comes from the industrial assembly common fund which is uh, at least five percent of uh, the national budget that's what is used to put together uh, into a fund and is shared for all the municipalities uh, district and municipalities in uh, in ghana so that's a major source of funding for as far as infrastructure is concerned for donor funds we have the ones that are channeled through the central government like the uh, district, uh, the DPAT, for instance, uh, district development facility. And for the case of some municipalities where we are beneficial, we also have the secondary city, which is a major source of funding that are uh, put together by the uh, donor funds that has transferred to some municipalities and which we are beneficial. It's a major component for now, uh, as far as infrastructure development is concerned, because the idea is to create uh, secondary cities you know uh, to that of um, so that uh, there will be a, a kind of some of the uh, big cities like Accra, Kumasi, Secondary Takra, the Metropolitan Assembly, I mean the kind of the flow of population will reduce so that when you have the secondary cities where they have the same facilities as the first uh, class cities, people wouldn't try, uh, move from those cities to uh, uh, the uh, first class is like the like a crowd. So this is one project that we are benefiting, and there are a lot of um, uh, resources that have been popped into this area. And we are using to build a lot of infrastructure, like roads, like drains, and like modern uh, uh, markets. For the internal generator funds, it's it's really uh, limited as far as use the uh, use of that portion for infrastructure because. Mostly, what we generate is uh, not enough uh, to even meet our recurrent expenditure. So we don't channel uh, much of the resources into uh, uh, financing infrastructure. Uh, but apart from the ones from the the, the central government and the, the donors, we also have some individuals who occasionally, you know, also uh, finance infrastructure. Because when it comes to uh, you know, developments. We don't only concentrate on what we have, you know, or what we get. We also see how best we can reach out to the private sector, civil society uh, groups, like NGOs and other state uh, uh, bodies who also come in uh, to finance infrastructure. Like the district assembly, for instance, when it comes to the basic ones, like uh, school infrastructure, like health infrastructure, like uh, in the case of water, boreholes. Uh, so that the central government takes charge of, uh, you know, the major dams that, uh, you know, goes to the urban areas. For roads, we only undertake the minor ones, minor repairs. But when it comes to the main, uh, you know, the trunk routes, it's the responsibility of the ministry, you know, the central government to finance the, uh, those infrastructure. When it comes to electricity, for instance, too, it's the responsibility of uh, the central government through the electricity company of Ghana to you know, provide electricity, you know, finance those uh, big uh, infra infrastructure. Uh, there's Richard made mention of uh, PPP. It's right. Uh, Mr. Ishmael, one more minute. Sorry. Yeah, the minute. municipality, thank you very much. The municipality are not taking advantage of this a modern form of financing like uh, PPP and the uh, bond market. So it's um, the idea is to, you know, I mean, take advantage by reaching out to the private sector where, you know, we can partner with them and finance uh, some of uh, this infrastructure uh, development uh, for the uh, citizenry. So on a whole, uh, the situation in Africa West is not all that bad. We think we can, but we still feel we can still do, uh, do more. Uh, to tap a lot of uh, uh, resources, you know, adopt modern uh, and innovative way of financing infrastructure so that we can meet the infrastructure needs of our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot, um, Mr. Ishmael. I would like to move to Mbale, Uganda. Uh, Mr. Mabala Richard, um, how are you? Yes. Yeah, good evening, good afternoon. Well, 
to the panel. Um, if you can introduce yourself a little bit and give us yeah. um, a little uh, of, a summary overview of your financials and how you finance infrastructure. Yeah, I'm called Mavala Richard Michael. I'm the city treasurer in Bale, Bale City. I'm glad to be uh, on this discussion team. Uh, one, like any other local government, uh, government, actually, I'm happy that Ghana is also almost doing the same as Uganda. In Bali, we have majorly two uh, sources. One is uh, government transfers, which amounts to about 92% of our budget. And then um, internally generated the funds, which is about 8%. eight or On inf infrastructure, out of the 8% of uh, uh, internally generated revenue, we have about less than 10%, which goes on if infrastructure and majorly for O and M, operation maintenance. And then out of the government transfers, we have around um, 92%, uh, around 80%, which goes to uh, capital uh, infrastructure. And this is majorly funded by World Bank. And that is uh, under a program called Uganda Support Municipality Infrastructure, OSME. So those are the major uh, sources as, as per now. But we've been having challenges with the internally generated um, funds given government policies. And the gener internally generated funds, we have about two major uh, sources and that is the taxes. And then we have property rates. Of course, we add on um, our park fees. Now government has uh, come up with a policy of uh, channeling the collection of uh, park fees. Uh, through uh, Uganda Revenue Authority. This has been a challenge to us uh, three, four years down the road. URA has not implemented, and this is a great loss to uh, Bali City, uh, just like any other, any other local government. Now, on the issue of property valuation, the challenge we have is that um, we, we, we need a lot of money to carry out valuation every, every year. You know, you're aware Bali is the, one of the developing uh, cities uh, in Uganda. And people are constructing day and day and night. So we need to cut out variation of properties every, every year. But we are incapacitated with the uh, uh, funds that can make us to uh, do the, the variation. Now, areas of, I, I've liked the discussion about and the findings of the team about PPP, which by the way, we've tried uh, to, to initiate. Actually, as we talk, we entered into partnership with the back, back Bay. But Bay is, 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 is a company that is a, has engaged in with Imbale to uh, to establish or put up a plant for waste uh, waste energy, and the purpose of that is that we need to uh, generate power which we can sell and then uh, get uh, local revenue out out of it. However, the bureaucracy has tended to push uh, this uh, this project to take a lot of time. Because as we talk, we need to get a license from uh, Electricity Regulatory Authority. So as to enable us to start uh, carrying out feasibility studies. So it, it is something that we, we've initiated and we believe when we, we get somewhere, we shall get um, our revenues. We, we also in a plan to negotiate with the, uh, one of our bankers, Housing Finance Bank. We have a building that we feel if we enter into partnership with the Housing Finance Bank, if they carry out the construction, then whatever re revenue that comes out, especially from the offices where we are now, goes direct to uh, Housing Finance Bank. So we feel if we have this partnership with Housing Finance, I think that would really help us cut off the strain of getting revenue to service uh, the loan, but also make it easier for us to have the, our infrastructure uh, put up. We also had an idea of, again, entering into an MOU with one of the firms on the issue of BOT, buy, operate, and, and transfer. We have our assets uh, in, the, in the city that we need uh, people to come up. We have failed to renovate them. We have failed to put them in use. We feel if we can have firms that are willing, we give them some of these assets so that they, 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 they do, they, they operate. Then later on, they can transfer to, uh, to, to, to the city. But meanwhile, as they, they operate, for us, we shall be generating revenue through trading license, local service tax, and then, and then hotel tax. So we feel if we can engage in more of PTP, 
I think we, we feel we see Mali City going up, up from. The issue of bond markets, I think uh, like uh, the, the team carried out uh, the, the, the survey. I want to agree with them that it's only Kampala that has tried uh, to come into the, the bond market. Now, cities, cities coming up, I, I don't see us really entering the, the, the bond market as for now, but we need a lot of information, a lot of sensitization about how bonds operate. Yeah, the other day I was with the Housing Finance Bank. I was, I was interacting with the, the manager. I asked how many local governments have tried to go for, uh, for, for, for this bond. Uh, actually, the answer I got was, was none. So that means it is a viable source of, 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 of financing our uh, infrastructure, but we need a lot of capacity building so that we can be able to get into that and then expand our, our, our financing. Now, given, like I said, policy, uh, government policy uh, pronouncements, we know we have uh, political pronouncements. We, we used to collect money from uh, border borders, we used to collect money from, from like, like I said, parker fees, but now it is a bit difficult. The money that we used to get from uh, sources like, like markets, now the policy is the, the people within such a facility are supposed to be the ones to collect. We had issues with the parker fees where we, we had the, 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 the tax drivers who were not really having the capacity to collect. So we made a lot of, 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 of losses. And the, most of those ones who, who were collecting had to run away with the, with the money. So I think we need also policies to change so that instead of engaging the real people operating in those facilities, we have a chance to open up so that we have capable people who can cut out the collection so that we can uh, improve on our, on our sources of, of revenue. Like, of course, government uh, transfers are moving lower Mr. and lower. Allah, one more minute, sorry, one more minute. Yeah, it, we could really request that government agencies tries to, to reduce on the bureaucracy so that Whatever, so that we can have ease of, of, of doing businesses uh, in a, in, a, in a bad, especially those prolonged bureaucracy, prolonged uh, policies, which are not very really effective in the short run. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very good um, quick summary. I would like now to move to Gulu. Uh, where we were scheduled to talk to Mr. Edward Kiwanuka, the city town clerk. But my understanding that Madam Pauline will sit on behalf of Mr. Edward. Uh, Madam Pauline? Hello. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Please welcome. Good evening. Good evening. I'm I'm Pauline Gulu City. I am also very happy to join the panelists this evening. And I want to thank the, 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 the organizer of this report presentation. And I want to thank all those who are participating. This is Gulu. Gulu has been a municipality, but recently, it has, it has been uplifted to, to the city. You're welcome, thank you. Um, so maybe if you can give us, uh, if possible, uh, the little uh, uh, summary on the overview of your uh, financials and how does Gulu finance its infrastructures right now and what are the challenges? Yeah, thank you very much. Gulu is among the other municipalities. I want to thank my, my counterpart, Mbale, for having elaborated more and more. In fact, the same challenges or the achievement the Bali city has is the same with the Gulu. The achievement that we have is that we have some infrastructures like the market, the main market, the bus park, those are the source of our revenue in the city. And maybe the street parkings, those are sources of revenue. But though we have other sources of revenue like abattoir and the rest of it, but our main source of revenue was the, 
the bus park, where the, 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 the minister for finance came out with a, a statement to overhaul or to change the issue of bus park collection, where this time we are not collecting. So we have lost the revenue in the bus park completely. That is a very big challenge. That's why this time Gulu is not, is not getting enough revenue even to sustain the infrastructure we are talking about. Financing infrastructure needs money, who needs funds. But as per now, we cannot, because our people, people's attitude are not yet well versed to paying tax. And even they don't know why they pay tax. This needs a lot of sensitization to our community. So the, all the reports here is okay with us. But the challenge is that our people, are not yet well versed with the with the tax payment and also the decentralization. If our government, if our country was well decentralized, the issue of a statement from the minister would not even come, because we, as the city or the municipality, were there just to look for our own source of revenue, and in which among them was the bus park, where we have been stopped from collecting the revenue. Ma Madam Pres Mr. President, I want to say that Gulu from the central government, the central government is giving us around 90% of the whole budget of ours. But out of our own source revenue, we are only getting 10% out of the, the total budget for the year. So when we get this 10 by 10% budget, it's like six six billion, which can do nothing because all the heads of departments are supposed to get that, 20, uh, that, 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 that money. In which when you allocate to all the part departments, each department cannot even buy a bag of cement to repair the floor, whether in, in, a, in a primary school or even from his own office, he cannot. So the challenges we are here is, we are, we are having in the city, now the city is that we need to improve on our own source of revenue. We improve by sensitizing our community, the importance of paying tax. And more so, we, the, the, the Gulu city is not yet to the level of Kampala city. The same with Mbali. The population of traders on, is not all the same. So you find that there are some people who are just there by name. They are not even doing anything. They just walk on the street with their things. So there is need to sensitize our people, the importance of paying tax. And more so, we call for more support. Since this is a new city, a city which has, been there, which has not been there, we were under the municipality. We have been talking of the bond, bond markets. This is still a new thing. Our city has come. It's still a new thing. So this needs a lot of sensitization to all of us, especially maybe in Bali and Gulu. We need a lot of support from you people so that we can understand exactly where we are going and what is what is what what we are going to benefit and how will it benefit our people down there so i want to thank you very much for for coming up with this thing, with, with this organization the, our own source revenue would even improve one more minute if, sorry madam one more minute yeah, yeah, yes thank you our own source revenue would even improve. This time we are having use meat projects. There are projects here, especially on, on, on infrastructure like construction of roads and the rest of it. But if we don't improve on our own source revenue, even maintenance and sustainability of those roads will defeat us. Sustainability of street lights will even defeat us. So I want to thank you. Be, be, be organized. Continue supporting us, especially Give us knowledge and skill on how to do it. We are not saying you should support us, but give us knowledge and skill on how to manage this city. Thank you very much. May the good Lord help you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. We really appreciate your intervention. Um, uh, and we, as we continue with the study, we will um, in, uh, incorporate uh, uh, the comments. I want to uh, introduce the um, facilitator for the next panel, uh, Mrs. Halia Ruan, um, for her to move 
to the next panel and then uh, to be able to have uh, the discussion from the technical perspective. Um, Halia? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the, the, the pre previous pan panelists, speakers and speakers. Um, I am Galia Juan. The, I am Senior Economic Development Speci Specialist at the Cities Alliance. I am responsible for uh, engagement with the private sector across the Cities Alliance work programs to attract, uh, to attract uh, private follow-up investment to Cities Alliance activities. And I recently joined the, the Cities Alliance and I am very happy to participate in this webinar and especially to contribute to good collaboration between UNDCF and the Cities Alliance serving African cities, of course. Um, since this is my first webinar, please uh, excuse me in advance if I make any mistakes. And uh, I am with my colleague um, Keith Mudadi, who can intervene uh, if he wants. Um, for the second uh, panel, uh, which is a um, technical panel, in this panel we have four experts on urban and local development finance who will share their insights on some of the key findings from the study on national enablers for infrastructure investment and economic development in secondary cities, which was a key output, of course, of the LEAP project in Uganda and Ghana. Uh, let me introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, we, we are joined in this panel by Dimitri Posidev, who is UNDCF Global Advisor on Local Development Finance and is based, he is based in Uganda. We also pleased, pleased to welcome Christelle Alvergne, UNDCF team lead for Africa, local development finance, and she's based in Senegal. And Dr. Nimoy Thompson, sorry for the pronunciation, Mr. Mr. Thompson, UNDCF technical advisor, local development finance, who is the author of the publication, uh, and he is based in Ghana. And finally, I am also pleased to have Sylvanus Ozornu. Uh, who's joining us. Uh, Sylvanus is the director of the Urban Development Unit in the Ministry of Local Development and Rural Development for Ghana. So, because of the short timing, we have four minutes uh, to each panelist. And uh, please then, I, I won't be uh, so long. I give the floor right now to Mr. Dimitri Posiedev. And I just suggest to Dimitri um, a question. And Dimitri, um, please, uh, what are the major obstacles of investment in secondary cities in uh, your point of view? And how can we overcome them? I give the floor to Dimitri. Thank you so much, uh, Galea, for your presentation. And uh, it's uh, a pleasure to talk after the first panel which uh, uh, where the participants have already indicated many of the obstacles and uh, also suggested the possible solutions to these obstacles, how we can improve the opportunities at the local level, at the municipal level to finance infrastructure. Let me just summarize what has already been said more or less and also what uh, Ni so ably uh, presented in the report. So the obstacles are in two major areas. One is the fiscal capacity of local governments to finance infrastructure, and the other one is uh, their technical capacity. On the fiscal capacity, we are talking uh, primarily about the limited uh, fiscal and budget um, uh, authority of local governments, uh, um, as well uh, as um, structure of uh, uh, municipal budgets and the structure of transfers. All of this results uh, in insufficient share of own source revenues. The municipalities don't have the fiscal flexibility to uh, uh, assign the rates and uh, identify the sources of revenues. They don't have the budget authority to uh, rearrange 
uh, funds between different budget lines. And this has been demonstrated during the COVID-19 crisis when the municipalities had to change their programs, but also had to wait for the authorization from the central government to be able to do so. And of course, the inadequate own source revenues as, uh, uh, as my sister Pauline, has, who, who was talking just before me mentioned, uh, is, uh, uh, is an issue because uh, if you have 10% uh, uh, of your own source uh, uh, revenues as your total budget, then obviously there is not uh, much uh, flexibility. In addition, and this has not been mentioned uh, in the panel, but uh, the report does mention it, is the prudential uh, limits on the subnational borrowing. So uh, in Uganda, it is limited to 20% of annual own source revenues. And uh, in um, uh, Ghana, it is uh, now limited to $400, if I'm not mistaken. But even if you take uh, the situation of Uganda, now 20% of 10% uh, uh, is of course only 2% of your entire uh, annual budget, which does not leave that flexibility uh, to uh, generate any significant um, uh, funding for infrastructure financing. Uh, I would like to present one um, slide, hopefully we'll be able to do so, uh, hopefully you can see it. So when we are talking about infrastructure financing uh, we, and we are looking at the existing financing model, what our um, uh, colleagues have just described is a situation where we have uh, the bulk of the funding coming through conditional transfers and you cannot do anything about it. They are already earmarked for specific purposes. A bit of it comes, and a really small portion of it, in unconditional transfers. Then come own source revenues, and then debt, if at all, because of the prudential limitations and other factors which we have just mentioned. What we are looking at, and this is the future financing model that we are trying to introduce together with um, uh, our partners, both at the national and local level, is uh, a top-down structure where the largest share of uh, municipal budgets come in own source revenues, followed by debt and other forms of external finance. And uh, our colleagues from Ghana have suggested uh, 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 those other forms uh, uh, of external finance, then followed by unconditional transfers and the smallest share of it should come in conditional transfers. So what do we need for that and how we can address it? Uh, we need, uh, of course, changes in the applicable regulation. The central government needs to reconsider the type of funding and the shares of funding that is disbursed to local government, uh, the tax sharing arrangements that are currently in place, uh, how the uh, tax revenues uh, are assigned and how they are determined. The obvious example, for example, is the tax rates uh, in Uganda, which is not even a tax property as such. It is a rate which uh, is charged on the annual rent amount. And of course, this raises lots of questions about what do we do with properties that cannot be rented in principle. So again- I'll give you one more minute. Revisiting, thank you so much. Revisiting uh, uh, that is um, very critical for enabling municipalities to engage in larger scale infrastructure financing. Now, talking about the technical capacity, municipalities lack the uh, capacity for project, for project uh, identification, for project development, uh, as well as for project structuring. They do need, and we have heard the examples, like for example, who knows about the bonds? How would you structure a bond? How would you develop a project? How would you do feasibilities? Uh, we are facing uh, problems. We have engaged with the, our partner municipalities on this front. 
And uh, it is not easy to identify, to get information and proposals from the municipalities because that capacity is not there. So the, again, the central government or regional governments would need to establish dedicated structures such as project development funds that would provide that support, legal support that would enable municipalities to uh, um, engage in bond issuance, also subnational pooled financing mechanisms because the fiscal space of uh, particularly in secondary cities is relatively small. It only makes sense if municipalities pool their resources, but for this, you would need an enabling regulation, which is not there. So we know the obstacles, and in most cases, we know the solutions to them as well. What we really need is political will to enact all those solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Then uh, I give the floor to Christelle Alvear and, and the Christelle, the, the same. I'm sorry, they, we just have four minutes for uh, each panelist. And when I wanted to ask you, uh, one of the key recommendations from the publication is to address threats to, to decentralization. It is, it is noted in the publication that both Uganda and, and Ghana face similar challenges of decentralization, such as the irregular, the irregular regular transfer and financial resources from central government to local government and attempts by the central government governments to decentralize power by um, withholding resources or procuring goods and services on behalf of local governments. So I wanted to ask you what reforms uh, can be put in place to strengthen decentralization at local level and what role uh, does decentralization play in terms of promoting economic growth and sustainable development, please? Thank you, Galia, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is indeed a very important question to understand and to try to answer the relation between decentralization and local economic development. And this is actually the credibility of decentralization and uh, even the survival of decentralization that we are talking about here. It is the capacity of the municipalities to be able to realize resources in order to deliver services and to promote local economic development. And for that, they need to be engaged into economic development. Without local economic development, the local authorities do not have the capacity to deliver services and cannot play their, their role. Uh, so, and I think that uh, Mr. Thompson presented a very good framework on this relation between the medium term plan and the whole, uh, you know, virtual cycle in terms of local economic development that we could come back on. So this study is very interesting in this matter. But actually, um, decentralization and local economic development require a new deal. And this new deal um, stands in three dimensions, in my view. One is a realignment or an alignment between national plan, uh, local plan, as well as uh, relation between planning and budgeting. I will come back on that. The second dimension is a new engagement of new actors into uh, decentralization and local economic development. And the third dimension is the dimension of innovation. So again, this call for a new deal uh, should be based on the new alignment between uh, the national plan, the economic plan, and the involvement of the local authorities in order to develop a new legal and institutional framework. We talked a lot about the PPPs, framework on not there, the relation between the ministries of economy and the ministries of decentralization are most of the time very limited and they need to be, ministries of decentralization needs to be engaged as well as local authorities association into those development plans from the, from the national uh, actors, I mean, we cannot talk only about sectors, tourism, agriculture, et cetera, without talking about where and how those sectors can be developed. Same thing in terms of alignment between uh, the planning and the budgeting and the resource mobilization process. That is also something very critical. Local authorities have to be strategic in the choice that they are making and how they can um, develop financial infrastructure to really boost the local economy. So that's the first one. The second one is what I was mentioning in terms of engagement. So I'm glad, Galia, that you are um, responsible for the private sector and the role of the private sector in uh, decentralization. And this is indeed something very critical. I mean, the 
the, the, the enterprises and the private sector, even the informal economy, needs to be part of the local discussions um, and needs to, their voices need to be recognized. Of course, I mean, in these developing countries and the countries, developing countries that we are working with, private sector does mean something different than probably in developed countries, but they need to be, they need to be there. Uh, it's interesting to see, for instance, that uh, women, for instance, or youth are not always part of the decisions. Think about a market in Africa and think about a municipal council. You can see on the market 80% of women in the municipal council, 80% are men. So this discrepancy is also something that makes things not really worked well. In, uh, in most of the countries. And then the third dimension, and we, we touch upon this, is the innovation. Indeed, we need to continue the fight in terms of transfer of revenue from the central to the local government, the need to change the fiscal rules in order to increase the capacity of municipalities to mobilize their resources. But this dimension of new financial mechanism the way to um, better engage the diaspora, to better engage the international funds available into uh, PPPs and into even SMEs that are of high local impact, it's something that is also critical. So those three dimensions are very important. I think that we should think around those lines. Thank you. Your micro. Yes, thank you very much, um, Christelle. Um, well, I give the floor to, uh, to the third pa pa panelist, Mr. Thompson. And Mr. Thompson, I wanted to ask you um, about the informal uh, economy. The informal can play an important, important role in the, um, contribu contributing to the revenue base of local authorities. So uh, what strategy can we can be put in place by local authorities to maximize revenue contributions from the informal sector in both countries, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yeah. Um, yes, the role of the informal uh, sector, which is prevalent both in Ghana and uh, in Uganda, and indeed in all post-colonial economies, the informal sector uh, in terms of employment uh, constitutes a disproportionate share between anywhere between 80 and 90%. But then it contributes a much lower share to economic activity or incomes. On, that, on the national level, it's around 40% of GDP. And that then tells you the high incidence of, uh, uh, or shall we say, low productivity in the informal sector because they account for 80, 90% of uh, employment but contributing less than 50% of income. Therefore, there must be policies in place to strengthen, i.e. formalize the in informal sector. There's been a tendency to idealize, even romanticize the informal sector, but that's dangerous. There's no way Ghana or Uganda or any developing country for that matter, transform its economy on the back of the informal sector by the very nature of it, because it's it's weighed down by high levels of informality, I mean, uh, um, low productivity. So we need policies. The thing is that there needs to be two levels of policies, one driven by central government policy, and the other one driven by local governments themselves. Indeed, I believe in the report or elsewhere in another presentation, I've spoken about the ILO's International Labor Organization's recommendation in 2015, that governments must necessarily formalize the economies. But of course, you need to know the structure of your economy, what is causing the informality, and therefore how to approach it. On the whole, about 60% of informal sector uh, economies are made up of individuals who survive mainly on daily marginal incomes. And it is not sustainable. So we need to put in place measures to move them into sustainable employment that will raise incomes that will then raise the tax base. And we need to make a critical distinction between the tax base and the tax net. The tax net is simply the number of people who pay taxes. If you expand the tax net and you get mostly people of low productivity and low incomes, you will still have productive uh, revenue 
mobilization problems. But if you grow the tax base with minimal increases in the tax net, you can still grow your uh, revenue. So it's important that we have policies in place to formalize the informal sector to the point where it'll be, they will have higher incomes and therefore increase the tax base for local governments to also be able to tax uh, more. But as I said, it depends on national policy. And before the national policy is implemented, local governments can do their own by, for instance, providing the necessary services. You can just tax people and not reward them with the corresponding services. In Ghana, Accra, the capital, the mayor once tried to increase the tolls that they collect from the markets. And one market woman walked up to him and said, convince me, tell me why I should pay you more in city revenue when you, I provide my own uh, security, I provide my own sanitation, I provide everything besides paying you. So there must be a relationship between what the municipalities collect from the informal sector and the services that they provide to the people who pay the taxes. It was interesting that one of the presenters from Rwanda talked about private sector collectors who actually run away with some of the monies they collect. There's a similar problem in, in both Laguna Sridhar and Cape Coast also. And this is where the technical capacity comes in, the technical capacity that Dimitri talked about earlier. Uh, not just in terms of project preparation, but also revenue mobilization. Even after you privatized revenue mobilization, you need the technical capacity to manage and to monitor that. All those issues must come into place. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, well, I, I give the, the floor to, to Sylvanus, to Mr. Sylvanus Adzorno. Um, Sylvanus, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, hello Sylvanus. Um, can you please share your experience on any measures that uh, the national government is working on or has put in place to create an enabling environment uh, conductive, conducive uh, for local governments to raise capital for financing infrastructure investments, please? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, and uh, want to thank also Cities Alliance and uh, CN, UNCDF for this important study. Um, we've been part of it, and uh, it's important that uh, I make this contribution to say that uh, we've been working uh, through the help of Cities Alliance from the beginning to introduce the municipal finance in Ghana. Uh, we've done a lot of studies, and uh, it's, but it's still work uh, that is ongoing. Currently, uh, I must say that we've been having a breakthrough and we have uh, a draft bill for municipal finance, which is uh, with Minister of Finance, and uh, is to be presented to cabinet uh, as soon as uh, the government uh, uh, starts uh, operating. And uh, it's important that uh, we allow the cities to borrow from the market because of the restriction by law uh, in our laws, not for the local government not to borrow. And this law, uh, in terms of municipal finance, can remove those restrictions. Uh, this work has been going on for some time, and uh, there's a consensus among all stakeholders. Uh, it's been uh, uh, agreed that we should move the way of uh, opening the flat gate for, or the gate for local government to go to borrow from the market to, to invest into infrastructure. I want to say that once it's gone to parliament and it's part of the law, uh, it can give this uh, uh, leeway for uh, enough borrowing for infrastructure. But it's important to know that we have other uh, policies that currently can help local governments to, 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 to invest or finance infrastructure, which is a PPP law. And uh, as indicated, it's important that we improve the capacity, technical capacity in banking project development so that they can be able to have projects that they can be able to advertise to 
the private sector to to be able to invest in. I also think that we can use the same PP law currently whilst we wait for the uh, environment for bonds in the country through the municipal finance bill that will pass, use the PP law to invest into infrastructure and particularly into those projects that have been identified by this study in Cape Coast and Agona Swedru. Use it as an example to prepare this project properly advertise them and allow the private sector to come in with capital to build this transformational project. I also think that apart from the bond market which we are trying to develop, uh, as I said, which will come to pass after the law is passed, there's a need for the local government to also look at their own revenue base to expand it with the current transfers from the central government, their own IGF, so the broaden the uh, revenue base using IT, which has also been identified by the, the study, then it's important that they use IT to expand their revenue base and uh, ensure that uh, the revenues they generated are used to invest into uh, areas that would uh, expand their revenue base. I think one thing I've also picked from here, which is very important for the country is the attracting investment from the corporate uh, social responsibility uh, which we have not been able to tap in the country but we have a lot of corporate sector that is willing to partner local government for investment into infrastructure and this will also be explored and uh, i also agree uh, with the fact that the the transfers which are going from local government uh, in terms of the common fund, which is 5% of the national revenue, the uh, DDF or the district government facility are not adequate. And I think we have to work hard to improve so that local governments can go into the market to borrow for infrastructure. But this can only happen, as Dimitri said, when they have the capacity to prepare bankable projects, which we do is still available for local government in Ghana to take advantage of. We are where the PP policy need to be revised to make it more local government friendly because it's kind of centralized, but we can take advantage of the window of that, the, the, the availability of that window to invest into infrastructure to the PP arrangement by preparing bank out project which I think should start from the project identified by the Cities Alliance and UNCDF study for Cape Coast and Laguna Suedro, so that we can show as an example to other second cities. And I also believe that there's a need to replicate this study in other second cities uh, for, 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 for them to emulate, because this is an operational action and is uh, uh, identifying current problems and current projects that can bring transformation in these uh, cities. So uh, the bond market is not yet ready. Uh, cities Alliance supported us. We are experiencing how we should go about it, but there's a need for to get political buy-in, which we are currently uh, seeking through the draft bill. And as soon as uh, the draft bill is passed into law, uh, we can start the bond market. But we as indicated, need to be ready technically, we need to be ready in terms of uh, the local government being able to implement. Because if you pass the law and they are not able to uh, manage the processes of the bond market very well, it becomes a still bond uh, law. So it's important that we, we train, begin to build the capacity of local government uh, using uh, the current study, the project identified, to show us an example of how we can implement transformational projects through private public partnership. And that 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 for me it will be a long way to motivate other cities to also come on board and uh, be able to build infrastructure without relying on own or from donors or from transfers from the national level. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much, Sylvanus. Merci beaucoup. Um, well, thank you for the panelists, for these technical panelists. I, if I can resume very, very quickly uh, what uh, we said. Um, 
the obstacles of uh, to investment in secondary cities there is two major areas there is there is fiscal capacities are limited limited budget and no fiscal flexibility there is a um, technical capacity to who, who is missing to build a bankable project as as we saw um what i've learned uh, from the discussions is that um specifically decentralization framework is one of the critical conditions to make to to develop the partnership between the local authorities and the private sector and concerning the informal economy if I can, if i can resume the two levels of community, both national and local are uh, must be put in place uh, measures must be put in place uh, both in national and local level to to move the informal into um, into the formal economy um, this is very very brief and thank you very much again to all the pan panelists i give the floor now to mr cobet for the the conclusion um, Mr. Corbett, are you listening? Uh, are you here? Can you hear? Yeah. I'm awake and listening and enjoying. So thank you very much. Uh, let me try and make some concluding comments uh, from what has been a very, very rich uh, conversation. And I thank Dr. Thompson for his presentation. And I particularly thank the inputs from, from Ishmael Richmond, Mabala Richard, and Madam Pauline from the local authorities, because they really brought this issue alive. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the big picture, we often forget, uh, although I don't, the officials who are running these cities and trying to make the best of, of incredibly difficult situations uh, because what we've heard is is because of the over centralized nature of much of the political economy is the big changes that still need to happen and dimitri made reference to the political will is still remains by and large in the hands of the national authorities uh, what we need is uh, from from national governments a a willingness to look at new institutional arrangements that will give local authorities more autonomy, more resources, more agency, including the ability to make mistakes. It can't all be controlled, allowing cities to experiment and, and find their own ways for generating revenue. Uh, a key element, and, and, and Madame Pauline made this, she referred to knowledge and skills, and that is the, the capacity and the strength of the local government. Um, and so that it is not seen as an administrative uh, instrument of higher levels of government, but as a, its own, its own um, authority able to take decisions. And I think key amongst the local government, the national government changes that we need is a much higher degree of policy certainty so consistent behavior over time and in particular with uh, uh, increased reliability to uh, the intergovernmental fiscal transfers if 90 percent of your annual revenue is dependent on a government transfer and that that transfer may be delayed it may be subvented it may be interfered with it is beyond difficult it is impossible to do ordinary planning but here we're talking about infrastructure infrastructure cannot be financed on the annual budget it requires multi-year planning multi-year financing and management and that is why without even looking at the photographs one comes to the conclusion that in the cities that we're discussing the infrastructure continues to fall behind the city growth. So under these conditions, it's impossible to see how any other outcome would happen. And that is sort of so fundamentally worrying about this because it is precisely in cities like Mbale and Gulu and uh, Agona Swedru. And I'm looking, looking my last one, I've 
lost it. Cape Coast. It's exactly, these are typical cities. And the problems that we've described are symptomatic of, of how urban growth is taking place across um, so many African countries. And so even though we're just looking at these four cities, this is an incredibly powerful study for pointing to the policy implications. And the last one that I just want to make reference to, because we talk about own source revenue, uh, which is practically uh, below 10%, uh, which really is an incredible weakness. And on top of that, you also have the political interference that come elections, uh, there's a, a disinclination to collect because it's, it's politically unpopular. And there's no way we can run cities like this. Uh, and the education, uh, they made reference to the training of, of the people, but it's also the training of the politicians because very often it's an unwillingness to collect, not an inability. And that's what destroys local government finance. An incredibly rich uh, one and a half hours. It wasn't enough, but that's what we have. And we also have to recognize that it is nearly quarter to seven in, uh, in Uganda. So our, we thank our colleagues for hanging on. From my side and behalf of the Cities Alliance, thanks to all the panelists. And, and our, our real challenge is how to work with our colleagues in these cities and take this forward. Thank you very much from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kobe. We have gone over time, but I really do appreciate all the comments and the closure. And uh, we should declare this um, webinar closed. I really appreciate all uh, the participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks, Galia. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks to the local authorities for hanging on. That was really welcome. Uh, Silvanus, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll send uh, the, the brief on the system. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi. Bye. Bye, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Pauline. Thank you for your intervention. You. And Mr. Ishmael. And Richmond, thank you so much. Thank you, Cities Alliance. Thank you, UNCTF. Good studies. Thanks. A good weekend to all. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Mr. Mudadi from Zimbabwe. <laughs> Very welcome. All right.